title for this afternoon's message would be Preparation for Passover, which uh, we kind of mentioned a little bit earlier. And the way I'd like to take a look at it is um, to take a look at how Christ, who is our Passover, prepared himself. So it's preparing for the Passover, and we're going to look at some scriptures that are very much tied into the Passover season, but not the scriptures that we read every year. Turn with me to Matthew 26. Matthew 26, and I'd like to just start off by reading verses 31 through 35. Matthew 26, verses 31 through 35. Then Jesus told them, that's of course the disciples, this very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered, that this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same thing. Let's take a minute to set the scene a little bit, where we are, what's happening, where this is going down, if you will. Jesus had just inaugurated the new covenant with the twelve, actually minus one, so it would be the eleven. And he gave them the new signs of the Passover, the bread and the wine as a remembrance of his blood, which would, within hours, be shed and broken. The old covenant would be finished out within the next 24 hours with the execution of Jesus in Jerusalem. After the Passover meal, Jesus promised them wonderful things. And you can read about that in John 14, chapters 14 through 17. And we do go over that each year during the Passover. And so I'm not going to do it right now. I trust that you know, you've all gone through this before. But he promised them wonderful things, gifts of peace and joy, contentment, comfort. And he told them about the coming of the Holy Spirit power of God. And this Holy Spirit, of course, was going to come to each of them and strengthen them and guide them along with the word of Scripture. He warned them of persecution, but he promised them of their ultimate deliverance from it. He prayed with them for their unity and for the unity of those who would come later. That's us. Then they sang the traditional hymn, and they went out from the room where they were keeping the Passover together, like we will do together this year. And it's here where we pick up the verses that I just finished reading. Now, perhaps these were what they discussed as they walked through the town, because they left the room, they walked through Jerusalem, and it says they walked down through Jerusalem. And if you've ever been to Jerusalem, you'll know what that means, because it's on a hill and you leave Jerusalem and you start going down automatically. So you walk down through the city, and perhaps they were talking as they were walking, and this is perhaps what they said. They went through uh, streets that were probably fairly festive with the Passover season. There were lots of people in town. There was probably lots of activity, families, people looking for a place to sleep, people looking for a place to have their Passover meal, all kinds of things. But they went through town, they walked out the gate, then they go down through the little valley, and you've seen me put maps of it up on the, on the screen. They crossed over the little brook that's there called the Kidron Brook, and they went up another mountain. We would call it a hill around here, but the Mount of Olives. They went up the Mount of Olives to a place called Gethsemane, which means the olive press, just someone's olive press. They had some private citizen, a walled garden called Gethsemane. Now, Jesus' conversation during the Passover, which I referenced or talked to, talked about just a little bit, that's the John 14 verses, you know, 14 through 17 chapters, was pretty positive. You know, it was kind of, you know, up, up, and away, 
This is going to be great. You're going to love it. New covenant. Yeah. We're headed in the right direction. Okay? But here, as they're walking along, he's actually starting to discuss some of the harsh realities, if you will, of the dark hours that were just ahead. And that's how he characterizes it himself. A dark hour. A dark hour. He had some lessons for the disciples, and I think he has lessons for us in this short section of Scripture that we're going to kind of dig in and look at closely. There are a number of lessons. Uh, The first one, though, I want to talk about is a lesson about weakness and strength. A lesson about weakness and strength. And so I put it to you that this is perhaps something to include in our preparation for the Passover, our own, uh, the time that we look at ourselves, if you will, we examine ourselves. Now you might wonder, why would, why would Jesus want to talk about stuff like weakness? You know, the shepherd is thumped and all the sheep run away and scatter. And it sounds pretty, sounds kind of bad. It doesn't sound like a plan for success. It sounds like a plan for failure. Why talk about such things at such an hour? I mean, if it were me or you, I think we'd probably say, well, come on, guys, hang in there, hold tight, we can get through this, and have that sort of an approach, because that's just the way we think. But he's talking to them about failure and their weakness and how they're all going to run away and everything's just going to seem like it's going really badly. Well, to go forth and to carry the message of truth into the world, they were going to have to be, they were going to have to be strong. They were going to have to be strong. But if you think about it, and you'll see this in life, I think, to be strong, sometimes it first helps to realize where you're weak. If you know where you're weak, you can work on it. You can build it up. I think I was thinking of the example of, of bodybuilding, for example, you know, and I joined the gym with my wife and we're doing this stuff and one of the reasons I wanted to do it because I felt I felt like my arms were really weak. And I used to remember I remember when I was strong. <laughs> That's faint memory. And I felt really weak in my arms and that was my reason. Because I'd felt weak, I'd been lifting things and I thought, Oh and I realized I was weak and I needed to go to the gym and I needed to strengthen that area of my body, where I was weak. And so spiritually, I think perhaps it's the same sort of thing. Realizing where you're weak, if you're weak, well, you are. But realizing that is a good thing, only if you do something about it, though. Just saying, I'm weak and sort of lying there like a lump isn't going to get you anywhere. Take a look at verse 35. Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same thing. So they were all saying the same thing, okay? They all thought, well, what, I'm going to kind of put words in their mouth, if you will, but I think it's fairly logical. They all thought they had sufficient love for God, that they were committed to this program, that they had the self-control and the courage to face the accuser. Jesus had told them that the dark hour was coming, they thought they were strong, right? Based on what they're saying here, they thought they were strong. They thought they were strong. But, and we'll read this more towards the end, when a group of 600 heavily armed men trudged up that same hill and came into the garden to arrest Jesus, everybody ran away. Everybody ran away. And Jesus was right. He knew. He knew they were all going to run away. He knew they were weak. And knowledge is an important part of realizing where you're weak, but it's also part of realizing how you can be strong. And with Jesus and the way he was approaching the upcoming death, his own death, and the way the disciples were approaching it, there's a lot of contrast And one I'd like to draw your attention to right here is ignorance versus knowledge. Ignorance versus knowledge. Obviously, the disciples really didn't know 
what they were getting into here. They really didn't realize how big a deal this was. They didn't realize how weak they were compared to the power of the adversary, to the power of Satan. They had no idea what they were up against. They did not know that he had entered into Judas. They did not know that Judas Judas was, in those hours, working with the soldiers and the priests, eventually to lead them to that very garden. They didn't know how the priests were going to react, how they were going to treat Jesus. And, with a special emphasis on this scripture that we just read, they did not know how to interpret the prophecies of the Messiah. And we have this one right here, which is from Zechariah 13. Zechariah 13. They couldn't understand these things without the help of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus did. He knew what was going on because he understood the prophecies. I mean, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. He had knowledge of things that other people couldn't know. But I don't know that it was like he had this funnel of information coming into his head. He had the Holy Spirit. He had the scriptures. He had what we have as humans. But he did an awful lot with it. And he talked with God. He talked with God. Jesus knew all the stuff that I just mentioned. He knew what was going on behind the scenes. He knew about Judas. He knew what the priests were up to. He knew what they were planning. He knew the human heart, where it was headed. He knew the prophecies of how all these things would apply in life. And he knew that he was walking through the steps of the Father's will and appointed plan. Let's take a look at that scripture in Zechariah. And it's Zechariah 13, verse 7. Jesus does paraphrase it just a little bit when he's when that's, that is quoted in Matthew. But in Zechariah 13, if you read verse 7 along with me, it says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is close to me, declares the Lord Almighty. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Now, hindsight is twenty twenty, but at the time it was pretty difficult for people to understand this scripture. It's not obvious to the casual observer that it's changed from talking about the corrupt leaders of Jerusalem and now it changes in verse 7 and it begins talking about something completely different. It's talking about my shepherd, says the Lord. And very interesting, I think it's talking about, it says here, the man who is close to me. And if you take a look at the underlying words in the original language, you'll see that it It says something along the lines of, he who is my fellow, he who is my associate, he who is in union with me. We're working together on this thing. Obviously, this is the members of the God family, one of whom is Jesus, and he is the one, of course, who's going to be struck. But it was difficult for people to interpret at that time because they had a very different concept of the Messiah, what all was going to be there, how it was going to happen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus knew that the verses were not talking about the untrustworthy shepherds of Judah, but rather were about God's shepherd, and that the mighty man who is at my side, or my associate, was the Messiah. And in hindsight, of course, for us, obviously this is the word, this is the Messiah, this is Jesus, and we know that striking the shepherd meant his death, that he would be put to death, and that they would all scatter Well, that referred to the disciples. Because he knew scripture, and he knew it well, and he had the Holy Spirit, and he talked with God, Jesus had a bigger picture in mind. He had the prophetic picture in mind. He knew that the power of God was at work and that it would raise him from the grave that it would raise him from death to life to lead his people. And if you look at these verses, if you go back with me to Matthew 26, he was so confident in God's plan and power of life that he was already making an appointment to meet them later. As he said, but after I have risen, 
I will go ahead of you into Galilee. If you want to read about that, he did keep his appointment. That's in John 21. I'm not going to go there right now, but you can read that. He was making an appointment. He was so sure and so confident. He knew what was going to happen. He knew that the power of God would raise him. He was already filling his outlook calendar, I suppose. You know, we'll meet in Galilee. He also knew that these things that were going to happen were not initiated by Judas. It wasn't something started by the priests or Pilate or Herod. These were the next steps in the plan of God for the salvation of mankind. And that sort of knowledge gives a person courage to walk through the plan of the holy days, to know that God has a plan for all people, but also for you, and that you're walking through these steps gives you courage because it's a plan. It's not a random pattern of activity that's taking place in your life that maybe, hopefully, somehow I'll get through this. No, it's a plan. And you're moving through it. And that's one of the wonderful things about the holy days as you march through them each year and walk through God's plan of salvation. You know this is planned. This is how it's supposed to work. Sometimes it doesn't feel right. Sometimes it doesn't feel good. But it's a plan and we're going through it together. And that, that can give you confidence. That can give you courage. Another one of the contrasts between the disciples and Jesus is fear versus courage. Fear versus courage. Okay? Let's go back and read verse... Ooh, my handwriting's so bad I can't even read it. <laughs> ah, Yes. Verse 31, then Jesus told them, this very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written. And then he quotes from Zechariah. Now, if you take a look at the words here, and there's so much is lost in translation. Uh, if you're reading in King James, it says to be offended. Uh, I believe you will all be offended because of me. In the NIV, it says fall away. The word there is a Greek word, of course, and it's scandalizo. Scandalizo. I don't know if that's a good Greek accent or not. It sounds more Italian, I think. But scandalizo. And it's meaning, if you go and you look up, if you have a you know, Bible dictionary or you have one of those little programs, I have a program where I can float over the word and it shows me the meaning. Its meaning is to entrap, to trip up. I believe it's very similar to the idea of, of Jesus being a stumbling block. What, what would entrap them? Okay, if that's the meaning of the word, let's think about it. Okay, he says, you're all going to be tripped up or caught in a trap. Can't get out. It's going to be tough. What would entrap them? What would entrap you? What entraps us? on a regular basis. The biggest trap in life is the fear of what other people think of us. What other people might think of us and what other people might do to us. One of the biggest traps in life. One of the biggest traps we'll ever face. Well, what will people think of me if I do that? Maybe if I can just lay low, hide out, run away. Now, I think the disciples, when the soldiers came to arrest Jesus, I think they were expecting things to go very differently. And they spoke with great confidence, we'll never fall away. And when these soldiers showed up, I think they'd seen Jesus do enough miracles that they thought, anything's possible. This guy has all the power in the world. I think they were expecting him to rise up and that that would be the flashpoint in history. And that, boom, that would start the whole thing with the kingdom of God happening before their very eyes. But it didn't happen that way. And in fact, he actually didn't raise a finger to protect himself or defend himself. 
And he said enigmatic things like, well, this is the plan of God. It's just unfolding. And I think when they saw that, they must have thought, well, if he's not going to defend himself, is he going to defend me? What's going to happen to me? Very, very, very important question. What's going to happen to me? So this false courage that they had quickly turns to fear. Now, many people in history have stood firm in times of battle, times of danger. So you can't just say, well, that's just the way people are, because some people are very brave. Some people are very brave. But if you're going to go down in death for a noble cause, you know, that's one thing, okay? But to go down in a cause where you're going to be considered a traitor, a low life, a nut job, a heretic by your own people, your nation, probably your family and your friends, that's a very different way to go down to death. And it's pretty hard to swallow from a human perspective. I would have a hard time with it. I don't know, maybe you're a better person than me, but I would have a hard time. Now, by comparison, Jesus, when you read the account, Step by step, Jesus heads steadfastly forward with great courage, with great courage towards execution, pain. He walks through temptation and then death, all that others might receive salvation, knowing that he was fulfilling the plan of God and knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Father could and would raise him up. Turn with me to Hebrews 2, verses 13 and 15, or 13 through 15, Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2, 13 through 15. And again he says, here am, oh sorry, and again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. And since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Ultimately, the disciples were afraid of death. They had no power to overcome death of themselves. They might have great confidence in all, you know, their, their courage or their commitment, but they had no power to overcome death, and they knew it. You know it. You don't have any power within you to overcome death. You rely on God. Now, Jesus was there. He was in human form. He was in the flesh. Yet, as, as I mentioned, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And in the flesh, but filled with the Spirit, he set an example for us, not trusting in his own power, but in the power of the Father. In the power of the Father to raise him up. As I said, so confident was he that he was making plans already. And that kind of trust takes humility. It takes humility to trust someone else, that they're the ones kind of going to take care of you. They're going to get you through this. It's not by my power. It's not because I'm so brave or so smart. I have to rely on this other person. That actually takes humility. You have to kind of accept it. Yeah, you know, I'm not master of my own fate. You think you are. Sometimes you need to m navigate your way through life, and you do have to, you know, be captain of your own ship in some ways. But you rely on God. Jesus had the humility. Remember, he was in the flesh and he was living a full human life. He had the humility to realize that he was weak in the flesh. Let's read verse 33 there. Let's go back to Matthew 26, verse 33. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. We read, you know, here Peter is boldly contradicting Jesus. Jesus has told him otherwise. And he's proudly proclaiming that he, of course, will be the most reliable disciple of all. All right? All others may scandalize so, 
or may be scandalizo, but I never will. Not me. Where did Peter get such false confidence? He seems to have put a lot of stock in his own courage, his knowledge, and commitment. Now, let's take a look at how Jesus approached the very same set of circumstances. Luke 22, verse 31. <clears throat> very exact same set of circumstances. Totally different approach. Luke 22, verse 31. 33, Jesus says to him, and this is just another account of the same, the same incident, he says, Simon, and that's, that's Peter's name, I mean, they're kind of toggling back between Aramaic and Greeks, that's Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, when you've been restored back again, and he was already looking forward to the success that would follow the failure, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Jesus understood what was at stake. And instead of having confidence in the flesh, he turned to the one who had the power to do something about it and prayed to the Father. Jesus knew that all the disciples would abandon him. He knew he would be denied. Yet, he was still willing to sacrifice himself for them and for you in all their weakness, their ignorance, and their false pride. In humility, he was putting their well-being, their need for salvation above himself. He submitted himself to insult, to incredible indignity towards his holiness and his place in the family of God. If you read Philippians 2 and you think about that, who he was, really, the Word of God, the Son, who stepped down from all that to live in the flesh and go through all that insult, indignity. He was willing to drink the full cup of God's terrible wrath against sin so that they and you could have life in the family of God. And so we see the first example of how he's teaching the disciples here. He's praying. He's praying. So the next thing I want to point out is preparation through prayer. Again, no, nothing really all that new today. Just trying to take a look at it from a different angle. Preparation and prayer. Let's, if you're back in Matthew 26, let's read verses 36 through 46. So they went to this garden, okay, Gethsemane, and that's where we're at. And then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, sit here. Well, I go over there and pray. And he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and that's James and John, along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. So he's kind of going deeper in the garden here. He's left the other guys kind of at the gate. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, is it, if it is possible, may this cup, that cup of wrath I talked about, God's wrath against sin, may it be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he turned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Could you not keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The body is weak. He went away for a second time and he prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. So, they, so he left them and went away once more. And he prayed a third time, saying the same thing. And then he returned to the disciples and he said to them, 
Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Now, even in the middle of incredible personal agony and anguish and struggle with temptation, Jesus was a teacher. He was always a teacher. He was always teaching them, showing them, setting an example for them. He was giving them a living, breathing lesson in how to prepare and deal with temptation and trial. While in the weakness of the flesh. Now this garden area was a private place away from the bustle of Jerusalem, the Passover. It was probably a walled, gated little garden. Jesus had some of them stay by the gate to protect, kind of to keep things secluded uh, so that he, he and the three could go deeper in for some privacy. And based on his later comments, he was expecting that the ones that he left by the gate would pray as well. And he took Peter, John, and James along with him into the garden to provide an object lesson in spiritual vigilance in trying times. Now, however, as we just read, the disciples, well, they didn't pray. They didn't do that. Now, I don't know why. Again, I'm going to take a little bit of liberty here and perhaps put words in people's minds or mouths. Perhaps they thought they had done enough. They'd given their word. They had accepted the signs of the new covenant. What, what, more, what more can I do? What could possibly go wrong? I'm here, aren't I? Well, you know, it was past midnight. They'd eaten a big meal. They drank some wine. They'd walked all the way from the city down and then back up the mountain. They were tired. The flesh was weak. So they slept. Now, Jesus didn't need their help. That's not what he was asking them to pray about. He didn't need their help. He was there to connect with the Father, the one who had the power to help. And if you read verse 41, Jesus didn't ask the disciples to pray for him. Let's just read that. Verse 41. He says to them, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. He wasn't asking them to, you know, help him through this, pray. He was setting an example for them and telling them, you need to do likewise. This is how you get through this kind of stuff. Watch and pray so that you can face temptation when it comes. Be alert, he says, and pray. Pray to the one who can do something about it. Pray to the Father. As I mentioned, Jesus was there in the weakness of his flesh, just like they were. He knew pain, sorrow, Temptation, grief, tears, he was soon to know death. But he had the understanding, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, of course, to know that strength and power to do great things and to overcome would come from the Father. If you know the history of, or the kind of the step by step of Jesus' ministry, you know that. Very early on, he faced this incredible session of temptation in the desert, which came in three waves. Satan went at him one, two, three times. It was some incredible temptations for him. If you think about who he was and what he had left behind, the temptations were very, very good. I mean, you know, just incredible stuff. And he, he met those waves of terrible temptation with the Word of God, with Scripture. And here we see it happens again, three waves, and this time he meets it with prayer. Can you imagine maybe what the temptations were that he was going through here? Why he would say, do I really have to do this? Do I have to drink this cup of wrath? You're the son of God. Why put yourself through this ordeal, this affront to your dignity, your majesty, your holiness, For what? For them? These guys? They can't even stay awake. So intense was the temptation. So filled with incredible sorrow, so deeply troubled. I mean, Jesus could see it all before him, betrayed by Jesus, 
abandoned and denied by his closest friends, rejected by Israel, about to suffer the horrible injustice of men to be mocked. Think God likes being mocked? To bear the full cup of God's wrath towards sin. And then to be abandoned by the Father. So intense that Jesus appears to have suffered from, I'm going to say this, hematidrosis. Hematidrosis. I looked this up in Wikipedia. Hematidrosis is this very rare, very rare thing that happens. Um, The symptoms are that blood usually oozes from the forehead, from the eye sockets, skin surface, the nails, and the umbilicus. That's your belly button. And it's caused by the bursting of the subcutaneous capillaries, the little blood vessels under your skin. And as it comes out, it mixes with sweat, and thus it appears more as a blood-tinged secretion. The etiology, or cause, uh, very rare, but may occur when a person is suffering extreme levels of stress. For example, facing his or her own death. And they have these pictures on the Wikipedia of people bleeding from their eyeballs. It's very gross. But it's there. Look it up. If you want to know how to spell it, it's H-E-M-A-T-I-D-R-O-S-I-S. He was sweating. It was so intensely stressful that it was like blood and sweat and tears, I'm sure. Now let's take a look at something that he's praying about. Submission to God's will. Jesus' personal example of prayer here is less about, if you think about what he's saying, it's less about changing God's design and God's will. God, can you change things around? I'd really kind of like, you know, it to go this way. You know, I don't want to suffer right now. Maybe we could put this down the road. Maybe I could suffer some different way. You know, I don't really want to have cancer. I'm really not, you know, I've got little children. I don't want to die. Could we, you know, change it around a little bit? His personal example of prayer and his own circumstances is less about changing God's design and will. If you think about it, what he's really doing is getting himself in line with God's will for him. And perhaps that's a new way to look at prayer. Maybe it's something you're already doing. To look at getting yourself in line with what God wants for you, even though you don't really like it. Let's look at verse 39. Verse 39 going a little further he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed my father if it is possible may this cup be taken from me yet not as I will but as you will verse 30 42 he went away a second time and prayed my father if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it may your will be done you can see his resolve getting a little more firm there To realize and accept and believe that his will for us, God's will for us, may not be what we want, but it's really the best way for us to get from where we are to where he wants us to be. That's submission to the will of God. How he plans to bring us into his family and to fill us with glory. Now, by contrast, the disciples were sleeping. I mean, here they were, present at ground zero of the most important event in cosmic history, and they couldn't even keep their eyes open. All right? They couldn't even keep their eyes open. And then when Jesus said, rise up, let's go forth and meet what's coming, where were they at? Well, they weren't ready. They were not ready. Matthew 26, let's read verses 47 through 56. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them, and the one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. And going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. And then the men stepped forward and seized Jesus and arrested him. And with that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck off the ear of the servant of the high priest. 
I think this was the moment they were expecting Jesus to rise up. And it didn't happen. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him. For all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you, do you think I cannot call upon my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? In other words, I'm doing this because I want to and I need to. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? And at that time, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you've come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat at the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place so that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then all the disciples deserted him and fled. I'm not going to read through Peter's denials. Uh, We've gone through that together before. You know they're there. If you don't, then read through it. It's in the following verses after the ones we've just read. The disciples weren't worthy of Jesus' love. I mean, look, they'd let him down in his hour of need. By human standards, they were right off. Get rid of him. You're fired. They simply didn't have the spiritual resources they needed. Now, they would get so much more. When Pentecost came around, they were going to have the Holy Spirit. It was going to fill them. They were gonna, it was going to be a whole new set of rules. But at this point, they didn't have the spiritual resources within them to get through this. And they, but they didn't know it. They thought they could handle it, and they couldn't. Now, Pentecost was a next step in God's plan, but we're not there yet. And what, by the way, Jesus kept his rendezvous with them in Galilee. I think I mentioned this. I kind of I blew my suspense there. He met with them again. Because he did rise up and he met with them in Galilee. And you can read about that in, in John 21. But for sake of time, I'm not going to go through the verses. I'm just going to you know, kind of paraphrase it a little bit. And if you read through John 21, and I, I, I hope you will. I hope you will. Just think about this. He made this appointment. He meets them again in Galilee. And when he's there, he's basically recommissioning them back to the task that he'd called them to in the very beginning. Right? At the beginning, when he called them at first, he called them out on the lake. Remember that? He called them out on the lake while they were fishing. All right? And both times, he filled their nets with fish. The first time, he said, I'm calling you to be fishers of men. Right? They failed miserably. Jesus, here he is. He's resurrected. He's living again. All the things that were planned have come to pass. And he fills the net with fish again while they're out there fishing because they've kind of gone back to their old routine. He's recommissioning them back to be the fishers of men that he wanted them to be in the first place. And with Peter, of course, he goes through three times with Peter, restoring him for each time that he denied Jesus' name. You know, feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. Take care of the church. He's being recommissioned. He's being restored, just like he said earlier. When you are restored, when you turn back. And we read that in Luke. So what had really changed? Well, let's take fast forward over to Acts 5. After the Pentecost and after all kinds of good stuff has happened, Acts 5, verse 41 through 42 Okay. The apostles have been out preaching in the city. They get arrested by the Sanhedrin. They get beaten. They get flogged. And in verse 41, let's just read this. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. They'd been beaten. They'd been flogged. They'd been disgraced in front of everyone they knew. But they were glad. I think they'd finally redeemed themselves. You know, well, not redeemed in this theological sense, but they'd kind of made it back. They'd restored themselves back. And then day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Now fully restored, filled with the Holy Spirit, they were prepared to face all things. And they faced it with prayer. They prayed together. There's many things you can read in Acts about them doing just that. 
Now, identifying yourself with Jesus, you know, like, like we've been talking about, scandalizo. Identifying yourself with Jesus means risking the disapproval, the disdain, the mockery of others. To be scandalizo or tripped up or trapped by fear of what others might think, what they might do to us, what they might not do for us. It's a powerful source of temptation that we must face every day. Will you face it with knowledge, courage, confidence, humility, preparation, prayer, and submission to God's will? Or would you rather sleep? Confident that you've done your part simply by showing up. Uh, unprepared, maybe. Not properly dressed. No oil in my lamp. But I can make it. Let's begin preparing for the Passover. I'm sure we'll have many more exhortations to good preparation. And uh, good day. <laughs>